Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Coffee. Without it, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We'd all be still living in Europe in mud huts. Here in Laredo, we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 4501 McPherson, the best coffee on the planet. If you can't get to Laredo, you can order from the Organic Man Coffee Trike dot shop. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Before we get started, let me just say that Australia has lapped the rest of the pack. Even the United Kingdom with four countries is way behind. With me tonight in a separate part of the world is Dario Beniquez. Dario was born in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. His family moved to Far Rockaway from the lower east of Manhattan, New York. He served in the U.S. Army in the Medical Corps uh, back in the Vietnam days. He also served in the U.S. Air Force. He was involved in Operation Iraqi Freedom, and he worked at Edwards Air Force Base. He served in the Air Force as a captain, and then he spent the rest of his time as a civilian, retiring as a program manager. He facilitated the Gemini Inc. Literary Arts Center Open Writer Workshop in San Antonio. He's also involved in the Voices de la Luna Literary Magazine. He has a BEIE from Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York, an MPA and an MS in Industrial Engineering from New Mexico State University, an NM and MFA from Pacific University in Oregon, and he has an MFA from Pacific University. Dario worked for the Tennessee Water, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority as well. Today, he is a writer and a poet. Uh, welcome to the show, and uh, hopefully this recording works out. Well, thanks for having me. Oh, just a, a minor, minor correction on the, the uh, Pacific University. I only received an MFA. I'm actually not sure what that other thing is, but oh. yeah, <laughs> okay. that's not a problem. Uh, I, I know uh, sometimes uh, we, uh, you know, we look at things differently. Yes. So yes, everything else is accurate not, uh, about what you said. Uh, Tennessee Valley Authority, Knoxville, Tennessee headquarters. I did work there. I worked there for five years when I was very young. I say very young, uh, maybe 25 <laughs> to 29. Okay. Yeah, that, Today, that's pretty darn young. Yeah, that's young. So I worked there as an engineering associate. Uh, Could you but, tell the, the listeners the reason for the Tennessee Water, uh, Valley Authority? Yeah, absolutely. The Tennessee Valley Authority, and I'm, and I'm basing this on my memory after working there in the 70s, uh, late 70s. It was established during the uh, the Great Depression, actually. Uh, that's when it was established in the, in the, the 30s mm -hmm. to uh, enable uh, electricity and to uh, to provide electricity to rural area, to the Appalachian area. And I mean, by that, I mean Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Alabama. And so they have power plants everywhere in those states. Uh, the thing about Tennessee Valley Authority, which is an excellent uh, organization, it's a government agency. It's the only power company that is a government agency. So if you work for them, you're working for the U.S. government. It's not Con Edison. It's, it's not uh, the Pacific uh, Electrical System. It does such a thing. It's it, they're all, they're not owned by the government, but although they are regulated by the government. So yeah, it's a government job. That was very interesting. And so I graduated from a New York Institute of Technology. And so I got a job there as an engineering associate, and I worked in design. And if you look at the cover of my zone of silence, that picture there, I actually was 
uh, the individual who designed how to put it up there and do the uh, calculation for what they call the, the microwave uh, yeah, the microwave antenna. And so that's a picture of me with uh, long hair and glasses, you know, and, uh, lo looking cool as I said back then. So yes, yeah. so that uh, and you were showing the book. Let me see if I can yeah. do the same thing. I, I can also uh, maybe we can stop the, uh, the background later on and you can see the book better but anyway it's called zone of silence and that picture is me because a lot of people ask me well who's that guy <laughs> he's got hair on his head you don't <laughs> oh, I, I look at pictures of myself from years yeah. ago and i wonder did i ever really look like that i know right it's another life altogether while you were there at the the tennessee authority did you ever get a chance to visit the land between the lakes I saw plenty of pictures of it. I think I went at least one time because when I was living in Tennessee, I lived there five years and I, I went to Memphis, Nashville. I visited a lot of different places and uh, those are all beautiful. beautiful. Uh, the topography of Tennessee is beautiful and, and so, also, so are the people. I really enjoyed my time there. I really wanted to go back, but then I joined the military. <laughs> so, so that, that uh, moved me around the country. I still have fond memories of living in Knoxville, and I went there. For, I lived there for five years. I was married at that time, also. So yeah. Oh, then you must have gone to uh, uh, Pigeon Forge. Oh, absolutely! Every oh. year in Dollywood and, yeah. and the Grand Ole Opry. I, I used to. I, that was our, our vacation. I used to go there to, to us Nashville. Uh, the the traffic in that place is just a complete nightmare, though. I I hate driving through there. Mm -hmm. That that was a long time ago, so it wasn't. I'm speaking about in that yeah. like the mid 70s, 1995. Excuse me, 1975 to 1979. So, mm. Yeah, so that was a different time period. But yeah, we still had a lot of traffic. I 40, I 40, I remind it, and I 81 or I 80. When when did you decide to join the army? I decided to join the army. I actually was doing the Vietnam War, and this is an interesting story. I tried to join right out of high school, even though I, people thought I was crazy. They say, "There's a war going on, don't you know this?" And so I tried to join, and uh, they said, "You're too young." <laughs> they told me, "You're too young to join the the uh, army." But says he says, "Come back when you're 19." <laughs> and uh, they didn't think I was going to come back, so I came back uh, when I was 19 years old, and I joined the the U.S. Army. At that time, and I, I was at Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn, New York. That's where I was inducted, and that's so I, I volunteered for the draft. I know that sounds crazy, but I did do that. <laughs> People were heading towards Canada and who knows where, and I was heading into the army. I, I said, I'm, I'm going to do this. They must have sent you to Fort Sam then in San Antonio for your uh, advance. Absolutely. Yes, that was my first encounter of, I believe, leaving New York. I had never been out of New York. Yeah, yeah, that was my first uh, time leaving, and uh, you know, I came over here to, and I say here, because that's where I'm at now. And I said, wow, this is really different from uh, from the big city. Did you did you get to San Antonio in the summertime or in the winter? I believe it was during the winter time. Oh, okay, winter time. you got lucky there. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it was nice. Time summer is uh, a hot box. Yeah, yeah. I've been here for 25 years now, and I, and I still like it. <laughs> I, I really like it. The, the man that taught me to be a paramedic, Bo McManus, was also a, an Army oh. medic. And wow. uh, he had a lot of interesting stories to tell, but mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll ever be able to shanghai him onto the show. <laughs> but that was, he was an interesting guy. Yeah, yeah. The, the, they called it the... AIT, Advanced Individualized Training uh, in the Army, and I got to, to, to see a little bit of uh, San Antonio then because, you know, you're in training, yeah. and you're in your uniform, so you really have to stay on the base uh, or the post, I should say, at that time. Yeah, I, I did OSET, uh, one station unit training where you have the same drill sergeants mm. the yeah. whole time. Wow. I got wow. to know them very well. They got yeah. to know Yeah. Uh, close up, right? I, I know what you mean. I, so, I know what you mean. And the yeah. funny thing is, two of them, two of the three guys, couldn't uh, have been but five foot four. <laughs> it's like, well, oh, anyway, that was yeah. years ago. <laughs> but they talk like they're six feet, right? <laughs> yes. 
they, they, they really, yeah, I understand that. I understand that. You wound up stationed in Germany at a, a hospital, I believe it was? Well, I my first assignment was to Ettlinger, Ellingberg, which is uh, by Karlsruhe. And it was, a, a, they call it a concern. It's a battalion mm -hmm. of a engineering corps. It was called the 78th Engineering Corps Battalion. So I was there uh, most of my time. And then, of course, they move you around in, in the... Uh, in the army, so I, I went to Landstuhl uh, Medical Hospital. I worked there for a little while. I went to Heidelberg Ho Hospital. I worked there for a little while. So they keep training you uh, mm -hmm. in different in different local. I went to Kursuski's uh, also, which I have poems of some of those places that I, I went to. And so yes, they move you up. But most of the time I spent was in uh, southern Germany, West Germany, what they call West Germany at that time, by the Black Forest, by the Black Forest. Did you ever? have any of the bizarre encounters that I keep hearing coming out of Germany? Uh, the, <laughs> I had a lot of bizarre encounters with the army. <laughs> but, uh, I ha you know, and I write, uh, there's a piece in my in my uh, collection. It's a prose and poetry collection where I do speak of, of Grafenvier, which they <laughs> most people that are in the army, if you say Graf, they know exactly what you're talking about. It's a big artillery center up north, and there's bombings and there's tanks there's all kinds of stuff and at that time uh, during winter you know i slept with all my with my clothes on and i'm on a, on a cot with no mattress shaved without outside there was a spigot in the, in the barrack uh, and that's how i shaved every morning because you had to shave mm -hmm. and and it was a steel helmet <laughs> I, I know it sounds like i'm 100 years old but but that's how it used to be yeah. So it was a tough, it was tough. Those are the strange experiences that I had. Uh, yeah, and being yelled at, too. <laughs> so, the, but I didn't see any anything uh, out of the ordinary. We did have a, an accident, uh, fortunately, there when I was there. And I write about it of uh, somebody that uh, actually fell asleep on the deuce and a half. You know what a deuce and a half is? Yeah. And uh, uh, I guess the writer didn't, the writer, excuse me, the driver did not see him. And so... Bad things happening. That that tends to happen far more often than yeah. you think possible. Uh, yeah. We were in tanks, and it was verboten to sleep anywhere near the tanks if you're on the ground. You either slept on the fender, or you had to go somewhere okay. rear. Uh, yeah. Even though you, know, you don't think a tank is going to roll away in the middle of the night, oh, things happen. Yeah, this guy was, I think, on guard duty. You know, you're supposed to be on guard duty, and maybe he fell asleep or something. But it was not good. It, it went out throughout the whole camp. Uh, you know, there was a lot of safety briefings after that. <laughs> a lot of safety briefings. Have it coming out of your ears. Yeah, there was a story about a werewolf that a lot of servicemen encountered in that area. I'm not too sure of the town. But there was a little altar on the side of the road. Uh -huh. You had to light a candle and leave it in this altar, and that was supposed to keep the werewolf at bay. And I've heard this story from a dozen different people that were all in Germany. Wow, wow, that's that's interesting. That's it. My only encounter with uh, with that type of animal was when I was living at Edbridge Air Force Base, and I used to I had two two different encounters there, uh, not with you know supernatural creatures, but with creatures. I used to jog at night at Edwards Air Force Base. It's Mojave Desert, so it gets really hot during the day, over 100 degrees. So you cannot jog or do it. So I used to jog at night. And one time, uh, I saw I was jogging along the street, and I saw these like yellow eyes looking at me. And you know, I stopped automatically because I said, "This is either a wolf or a coyote," and they think I'm food. <laughs> and I said, "Because you, I was jogging, and they like to chase stuff." Mm -hmm. Take things that move. So I stopped. I, I was paralyzed. I just stopped, and I just was looking at. And I call him at him, <laughs> him. And I, I just saw these eyes just staring at me. It was the most most spookiest thing I've ever heard or seen. I, I should say. And uh, and then you know I just was paralyzed. Then I started walking, and then I I, I just walked all the way back to my apartment because I used to live in an apartment. And then those eyes decided to go elsewhere. <laughs> Thank God for that. You wrote a poem called Edwards Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. What was yeah. the story behind that? Uh, that that uh, When I was at Edwards 
uh, Edwards Air Force Base, and that's in Rosemont, uh, California. I have to say it that way because the people get confused with Rosemont, but it's Rosemont, California. It's in the Mojave Desert. That is where the space shuttle used to land, and I had the opportunity to see it land one time. It was just an out-of-sight experience for me. So uh, that poem, it's called Edwards Air Force Base because it never, it really rains there. It doesn't rain there at all, hardly. So when it does rain, people just go crazy. So they always pull it prank. And so when I was driving into the base off of Rosemont Boulevard, I looked to my side, and they have what they call dry lakes. Mm -hmm. So that dry lake had water in it because I just rain. And the prank is they put a fin there like a shark. So when you look to the side, and everybody, oh wow! And so that's uh, you know, and I, when I went to the job, I had never seen it. All those times there, you know, I was there for five years. I think I only ran like three times. And I went, so when I went to the bed, I said, hey, did you see that? Did you see that fin? And everybody, oh yeah! Every time it rains, we don't know who puts it out there, but it's out there. And so that's that's the story behind it. And it comes out in the paper, and everything. Everybody makes a big deal. The shark, the, the shark returns. So that that's that's what that's about. Here, I thought you'd had a paranormal encounter out there. <laughs> I, well, it's kind of abnormal, let's put it that way, <laughs> to see to see a shark out in a, dry, in a dry lake. How far from Edwards Air Force Base would Fort Irwin be? Ooh. If you could give me the time, because I don't know that much about the oh. Army, I, I can tell you how far. But it's not near... Edwards Air Force Base because I traveled all the way to San Francisco and to Los Angeles, and uh, and I I'm not accounted for Irwin at all. But we can you know we can Google that and find out what's that. Yeah. I, no. I was out there at NTC one year and it was a uh, I I thought I was going to freeze to death the whole time I was out there. It never got oh. above fifty. Wow, that must be Northern uh, California then, because that's that's where it freezes up there. I it gets cold. Remember. All, all I know is I spent about a month out in the desert. I was supposed to be working on a tank, but instead I wound up guarding the talk for a month. <laughs> wow. And well, that's, that, month. that's the Army. Nothing but officers, as far as the eye oh. could see. And I was a E-4 at the time, so I was scum. <laughs> like we used to say when I was in the we worked for a living, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, that's that's pretty. Yeah, so no, I... Like I said, it's it's uh, it sounds like northern because it, it snows up there. If you mention snow, that's that's what I'm guessing. Like all that snow behind us <laughs> in that picture. Did you go straight from the army into the air force, or did you take like a couple of years to enjoy life? I actually, uh, I don't know if I, I, you could call this enjoying life, but I went to school after the army. Hmm. I went to school. And then I worked for a while, and then I went back, and then I joined the Air Force. Well, that's so, how you became a captain. Yes, yes. I went to uh, officer's training school, believe it or not, right right here in San Antonio, in Medina. Hmm. Medina. That That is closed now. They closed Medina uh, Officer's Candidate School, and now they moved it to Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama. And so I went to Montgomery, Alabama, too, for what they call Squadron Officer's School. That's another. So I went to two different schools. Uh, at that time when i was going through uh pldc we were up at uh camp mabry in austin hmm. and they were having the officer candidate school at the same time oh wow. and i watched i watched the thing that those folks had to go through and i swore i would never become an officer uh, yeah. just because of what i saw there yeah you know what uh I can talk a lot about that because I've been through both the Army and the officer. And the officer's uh, school, they concentrate more on, on uh, learning tactic and strategy. And, oh, Lord, I, they taught me so much about the Air Force history. <laughs> but they, they do have uh, exercises that they do. And uh, so I found, I found basic training or boot camp a lot harder physically, physically. Mm -hmm. Than I did for when I went to the officers candidate school. I, I, I said this is nothing. I can jog. I can do. I can do all this all day long. I, that didn't bother me. But the studying was tough. Was tough. I have to I have to say you have to study a lot and pass the test. So Wait. that.
It that, that's what any fun. Yeah, that, it, yeah right. so I, I didn't have a lot of fun uh, as a as a you know when I exit out of out of the army. I went right to school and started started uh, you know just trying to educate myself. Really, I, I I'll tell you a funny story. When I was uh, I think I, it was funny when I was going to school, uh, one of the teachers uh, or professors was uh, asking me and said, "What are, why are you here?" You know, and I said, "J O B." And he looked at me. He said, he made like a frown, like, come on, you're, sp- this, you know, you're supposed to be educated. And, mm-hmm. and I said, no, I'm here. I need a job. And that's, that's how I used to think back then. Well, we all yeah. need a job. That, that's what a lot of people don't realize when they go off to college. Right. They're not really learning a job. They're learning other things, but they're not, they're not right. getting trained to go into the workforce. Exactly, exactly. They get I, out of college and nobody will hire them because... Oh, what do you know? You know how to read a book. Oh, big deal. You know where the library is. Right, right. I I agree. I agree. And that's, and that was, but you know, that's, you know, those professors are professors, you know, or instructors, whatever you want to call them. They, they're, they want, they're involved in their, their topic and their subjects. Mm-hmm. So, so anyway, uh, yeah. So I, I fought, I saw, I, I'm looking at Fort Irwin. It's a, uh, it's uh, north, uh, east of Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. That's where it's at, and it's a uh, Death Valley. So it's yeah, it's in the, there's desert around there for sure. Wow, that must have been a, right. it's strange that it snow there. <laughs> it was it was cold? It was dark, but I did get to see a lot of stars while I was out guarding the top in the middle of the night. Okay, okay, yeah, I see Bakersfield there. I was looking at the map. I just was curious because I'm I always uh, you know I've been around. California a lot, you know, and it's any place I, I I used to go to, I would always, uh, you know, try to enjoy myself and learn and learn, and learn the geography, learn about the people, learn the stuff that's going on. Uh, any place I went, Germany, any place that sent me, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, any place I would I would always want to go and visit the sites if I could, if I could. I guess I ought to mentioned this before somebody gets confused we are not in the same room in fact we're not even the same town <laughs> looks like we are so uh, don't get the false impression that we're sitting side by side at a desk yeah. the wonders of computers yeah this is a, a virtual room <laughs> a virtual space we're, we're only about 150 miles apart right now. Yeah, exactly uh, what time? At what point in your life did you discover that you were going to write a poem? Uh, I I always uh, I always enjoy listening to literature, poetry, if it, even if it was uh, the Psalms or, or the Book of Songs, anything like that uh, caught my attention, and I like the sound of the language. Uh, the music of the language, the way it sound when you write it using lyric, it's like song lyrics. You know, there's a lot of repetition, so I always enjoy that. And uh, you know, I just wrote something here and there. That, you know, when I was a younger person in high school, maybe I wrote uh, one or two things. But it, to me, writing something down on a piece of paper is like a miracle. You know, being able to take what's inside your head and put it on on a piece of paper. That's a that's a a form of translation. You're translating what's in your head onto black and white. And so I, I started that very young, very young. And so I would say in high school, and even before high school, I, I, uh, I enjoyed the language so much that I wanted to, to, to learn more about the language and how to do that, that process. You can call it poetry, you can call it composition, you can call it short stories, parallel. But it was that 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 trigger in me that that I liked a lot uh, listening to the language. It's it's like when I discovered that I can in eighth grade that I can uh, make a, a little light turn on with a battery and watch some wires. <laughs> that also got me engaged in science. I said, "Wow, it's miracle that I can make this little light go on in the eighth grade." So yeah, so it was it it was kind of early kind of early that I, I got into listening. And if you speak two different languages, you almost, you're forced to, 
to pay more attention to language mm. because yes the, yeah, so there's no way you know i mean people that speak one language uh, don't have the same experience because i have to focus on language so i can communicate uh, to people and, and i remember that that there's two languages out there oh, there's more than two languages obviously but at least in new york mm -hmm. in public school 61 uh, on 11th street that was my first uh, elementary school that I went to, it was right there in the Lower East Side. We spoke two languages there. Oh, my wife is a bilingual teacher, yeah. even though they are not yeah. that big on having bilingual education. Uh -huh. A lot of people consider it a waste of time, but she is 100% mm -hmm. enthusiastic. A lot of people think yeah. that bilingual education was created so that kids could learn to speak English who didn't. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it was started here at the air base because mm. the the families of the airmen, they wanted their kids to learn Spanish mm -hmm. so they could communicate with the local people. Mm -hmm. So the bilingual education in Laredo was started so that the white guys mm -hmm. and the white girls could learn to speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somehow it got twisted around to this thing where... Oh, bilingual, that means you're, you only speak Spanish and you can't speak English. It's like, actually, it was the other way around. Wow, that's, that's interesting history. That's, that's beautiful that, that, you know, to learn about that. Uh, I know when I went to Germany, I was there in Germany, and all the guys, they knew I, sp I spoke Spanish, but they want to know, can you speak German? <laughs> I said, well, okay, German. So they, <laughs> they looked up to me to learn the la German language, and I learned enough that I can go by myself into the city, get around the city, and ask, and you know, I could do, I, had, I did conversational uh, German. So I learned German when I was uh, in Germany. And it's, if it, your brain is facilitated to, in that process that there are other languages out there. And I, and I love the German language. I, if I hear it now, I know right away you're speaking German. I don't speak it like I used to, but because I was young, but, but I, uh, Germany, German is, is great too. And, and the thing is also that you and I, if we publish something, we want to get it translated. I want the people mm -hmm. in, uh, in Chile, in Argentina, to be able to read my book. You know, that would be great. I would even listen to your show, right? Mm. I, I was working with a local here in town who was going to translate strange things into Spanish, but I don't know if that ever happened. Uh -huh. uh, it's one of those things, I don't have enough time to pursue all these different Yeah things that are going on in my own life. Yeah. Also, my books, the Laredo Paranormal Research huh? Society and Paranormal Laredo, people keep asking me, is it in Spanish? And it's like, yeah. oh, I'm trying to get my wife to do that. But uh, yeah. she's a school teacher and she doesn't have but five minutes of free time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. I, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. I have a friend from Mexico City and he said that, yeah, and I just met with him. He said he, he made. He said, "Let me let me try to translate one or two of your of your prose poems." I say prose because they're easier to translate because they're little stories. And he says he's going to be doing that, so he's working on that right now for me. He's from Mexico City. His name is uh, Miguel Miguel Gallegos. And I said, "Yeah, do it, do it." I mean, I, I want my book to be. Uh, these people in in Argentina, in Chile, in Peru, in. Uh, in all these countries that you, you hear, they're not aliens. <laughs> they're real people like you and me, and they love to read. They read more there than we do. They really, because they don't have all these shows and these distractions that we have here. You know, big movie, Six Flags, you know, with all the, they don't have that. I mean, they're still, I mean, they're modern and everything, but they still do a lot of reading. They respect people that read and write. That's extremely important for them. I so can't. there's a market there. I can't understand people when you they say they don't read. It's like, yeah. Now that's an alien concept. <laughs> I know, I know. Especially people that say I write, and they don't read. And I say, well, how could you write without reading? That's it's, it's crazy. <laughs> I know about writing, which isn't a whole lot, but all of the the people that do this and make a lot of money doing it, they all say that in order to be a good re writer. You have to be a reader, and and yet that you got these people that ah, I don't want to read somebody else's stuff. I want to write my own. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, know. Uh, I don't want to be influenced, right? Quote unquote, because you know I'm unique and special. So I want to be 
uh, not influenced by these other writers. And they, they don't know that these other writers are great writers. <laughs> mm-hmm. And all the time that they spent reading and writing for years before they were able to get published. They, they don't realize that, that it doesn't happen automatically. I'm sure you do, because I saw those books you had, those wonderful books that you had. I said, hey, this this guy's like, he has to be a reader. Look at all these books. <laughs> I was on my fourth nonfiction book before I would say that I was a writer. Uh, I used to consider people like Dean Koontz or Hemingway, people oh. like that, those were writers. Yes. I was just some clown that was putting words on a piece of paper and hoping yeah. somebody would read it. Uh, recently, since my fourth book came out, I have actually been introducing myself as a writer. But every time I say it, I'm like, is that? Yeah. Uh, maybe when I've got my sixth or seventh book out, I'll I'll yeah. feel more like a writer. Yeah. But yeah, you, you got to be a reader if you're going to write. Yeah, that's true. When you are going to write a poem, do you know what you're going to write about and what you're going to say or does the poem pop into your head and then you just fill in the blank spots uh, that's that's actually a excellent question and it's one that it's always asked a lot about you know how does you where did the poem come from where does it come from and for me if for example it's good to to give you an example and speak from specifics. So the poem Arrival that I have is, is at the end of the, the book. So where did that come from? Well, Arrival, you know, I watched the movie Arrival. <laughs> I watched that movie, that was pretty good. Uh, there's many movies called Arrival, there's at least two movies. It, it My poem didn't come from that, but it, it, it planted an idea in my head. So where does these Poems come, they come from external sources, mm-hmm. from everything, from the snow behind you. You know, maybe I'll write a poem about the snow, from from discussions. So that poem, Arrival, came from thinking about aliens and, and UFOs and people that are, that are looking for a place, they're looking for answers, and they come to us. They, they make them, they manifest themselves they look like us and they ask us questions, you know, tell me about how can I, you know, for example, lead a successful life. Mm-hmm. And and I don't want, I, I give you the end like this, I'm gonna give you the spoiler <laughs> of the poem. So at the end, they leave because we didn't have any answers for them. That's because we don't have any answers for our own selves, right? It, those are questions that, that Everybody asks, why are we here for? You know, how do we get here? So that that's an example of a poem and how I generally work. Uh, I have something outside of me, something that happens, uh, I, or maybe a movie or story that I read or a conversation I have with a friend. I have a poem about Miguel Gallegos, uh, about an incident that he told me what happened overseas. That's one of my first poems. And uh, how dangerous it was, I have a poem about uh, Iraqi freedom because I I experienced that. The one about Lance Jewel Hospital, that actually happened to me, where I went to the hospital and the the technician there kept calling me Khalid. And I said, <laughs> and I told him three or four times, I said, my name is not Khalid. Uh, and I told him, and I showed my ID. And then at the end he says, a colleague goes, the doctor's ready to see us. Okay, this guy's not going to get it <laughs> at all. And the reason why he, could, he was able to, because I was uh, really, really sick at that time because of a situation that happened in uh, one of the, in those undisclosed locations that I was, this is doing Operation Iraqi Freedom. And I couldn't really defend myself. I was just called up into like a ball and I, I was really sick. Mm-hmm. And so he just, kept calling me the wrong name and I, I said, okay, I, I, I'm too sick. I can't argue with the guy. <laughs> Just let me see the doctor. <laughs> and interesting enough, and uh, this is a kind of like a funny thing, when I saw the doctor, his name was Cariño. Now, if you know, Cariño in Spanish, in English means uh, somebody who cares for you, somebody who wants to hug you. He, you know, that person has a lot of Cariño 
and it's ironic that his name was Carino. <laughs> and so I said, wow, that was that was interesting. So that's in that, that poem called Landstuhl Hospital. Mm-hmm. And that, so that's another example of where these poems come from. They come from real life experience, they come from stuff I read, incidents that happen in the world, and they all serve as, as, a, as, as triggers for me to generate work. And a lot of it is uh, it's, it's being creative and making a story of, of uh, I like writing narrative poems, by the way. I like, I write more narrative poems than I write what they call lyric poems mm-hmm. that, that deal with more with the emotion, something happened. Or better. I have maybe two or three of those, but most of my, my poems in, in my, my collection, they're narrative. They tell stuff that either happened to me or happened to other people. So I hope I answered that question. You know, I think that's that's how I work. Jumping ahead from your your book, you mentioned the Chupacabra incident of 2022. Yes, yes. Could yes. you tell us about that? Yeah, uh, and uh, so my wife and I we also like to walk at night. You know, the doctor the doctor told me you need to walk 30 minutes a day. <laughs> that's what my cardiologist told me. And I said, so we started walking. And so we like to go to the rim, which is actually uh, maybe 10 miles from where I live. And there's a, a street called La Cantera Parkway. And there's also another street called Van Jackson uh, mm-hmm. Parkway. And they intersect. So it's usually at night. We walk at night, you know, between 8.30 to 9 o'clock. And, uh, you know, we, it's it's pretty isolated there, even though there's, a, there's restaurants. But up in that part of town, it's isolated. It's very dark. And there's also an incline. There's a street that has a, a huge incline. So we were walking uh, one time, and I said, and I thought, what is, what is that thing over there? And it was in the parking lot, you know, pretty far away. I, I'm going to say maybe a block away. So we see this long black thing. I'm going to say it's because it was dark. No, my wife actually said it was brown. She's got better vision than I do. She said, she said no, 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 it's not black. It's brown long almost like a dash hound real black with a snout and she said that it was hairless it didn't have a lot of hair on it and it darted i mean this was really spooky i'm not i'm not kidding it darted across the street moving very very fast and we knew said that's no dog i thought it was a leopard <laughs> i said what is that crazy thing and so we labeled that. I said that was our chupacabra incident because it was odd. It was an odd animal and it was dark and it was spooky and it just darted across almost. A, and we could see it going across the street. And we were really, really, uh, you know, we were like, oh, oh, wow. We were, you know, flabbergasted. We were just in awe that we had seen it. We just, talk, we still talk about it. <laughs> we still talk about it. And that happened in the fall, you know. It was early on, actually, it was in the, in uh, 2022, it was early in the year, I should say, during the winter time. So, because we walk during every month, we walk almost every day. Mm-hmm. So that, that happened. So I don't know what was it. And so we said it had to be something supernatural, something weird like that. A lot of sightings are given a name. For example, when I saw this strange thing under a railroad bridge, I immediately began calling it the rake because that was the only thing I could think of. Well, then I found out there's such a thing called a pale crawler, which is a much better description of what I saw. Oh, wow. Now I've had to change what I call the thing. So calling a dark thing that you see, a chupacabra, nothing wrong with that. But then you've got these people that are going to just assume that what you saw was the creature from Puerto Rico or <laughs> all the, the blue dogs here in Texas. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, that's like when they talk about the Loch Ness Monster. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. say it looks like a plesiosaur. And right away, here comes the scientists. Oh, it can't be a plesiosaur. They died out millions of years ago. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The witness didn't say it was a plesiosaur. They said it looked like one. Right. That's good. That's good. That's People good. don't want to admit that there might be something that looks like a particular creature, but it's not that creature. We don't have a name for it yet, so mm-hmm. call it 
what you think it is until you can find out for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that was an a interesting sighting, sighting mm -hmm. that, uh, that we saw. No poem about the chupacabra, though? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. It'll be maybe my next collection that I'm working on. How did you get interested in the zone of silence? Well, that one, uh, that came from uh, watching Ancient Alien. I, I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> I, I was, I never heard of it, right? So I, I, I'm a, I like that show. It, it, and you laugh because it makes me laugh too, Ancient Alien, because all the stuff that they say, and uh, some of it is believable, some of it's not believable, but it doesn't matter. I, I just, I just like it. I like that kind of thing. And they mentioned it one time, uh, just like they mentioned, and I won't digress too much, the Nazca Plateaus, mm -hmm. they, I think that's in Peru. I, oh, I, I like that idea that there's an uh, airport or a landing site in Peru <laughs> called the Nazca. And then, so they spoke about the, uh, La Zona de Silencio. And I was like, well, I never heard of that. And I said, well, this, it reminds me of the Bermuda Triangle. Mm -hmm. And there's many, many shows on the Bermuda Triangle, which is next to Puerto Rico and Florida and Central America. So that's the triangle right there where the ocean's real deep and stuff. It's the same phenomena. You fly over over it and all kinds of stuff can happen. So that's how I got interested in the La Zona or the Zone of Silence. There are two movies out. I just watched uh, the one called Silencio. It's, it's, it's bilingual, I speak about bilingual. There's some Spanish in it and some English, but it's mostly English. And uh, that's a lot, uh, that movie's about a, an hour and something. Uh, it's a, it was, I think it was, uh, it came out in 2021, so it's not an old movie. The earlier one, it, it's, uh, it, it's more like a Wayne's World movie. It's one guy with a camera <laughs> going around. <laughs> that was kind of funny. But anyway, so yes, that that's how I, uh, got in, in, involved with, and then I read all about it. And I also, interesting enough, I also used to live in Las Cruces, New Mexico, which is right next to White Sands Missile Range. Mm -hmm. And when I exit out of the, uh, the the Air Force, I used to go there and do shopping there because I had my privileges. I still was in the Air Force when I moved to Las Cruces, New Mexico, from uh, Cannon Air Force Base. So I used to go to White Sands Missile Range. I know that area very, very well. I also was part of a uh, one of my projects was at what is called the White Sands Test Facility. A lot of people don't know that NASA has a, a test facility near White Sands uh, in, in New Mexico at, at the outskirts of Las Cruces, in the northern part of Las Cruces. It's called White Sands Test Facility, and they test engines there, mm -hmm. rocket engines. And so that was one of my uh, assignments that I used to go there all the time and visit that. And so, you know, I have a connection to White Sands, and that's where supposedly a missile was fired from Utah and then it, it it was supposed to go to the white sand and it went off course and it landed at that desert my peepee lesson what they call my peepee less uh, a desert in mm -hmm. Mexico and then it, it contaminated the whole site there yeah but there was a active uh, isotopes on board for some mysterious reason yeah I think it was cobalt 67 yeah I don't know it, it, this, that's probably was some secret uh, project that they had, and it went, of course. But they had to uh, clean it up, and there were people all in suits, you know, like you saw. If you ever see E.T., mm -hmm. <laughs> you see those people in all those suits. And that's scary. That scares people when you see people uh, like that. And so this, they say that that caused mutation, and, and it's believable. Radioactive will cause mutation. Right? That's There's no doubt about that. You know, Madame Curie and Radiant caused all kinds of issues. Uh, back in 1922 with the, the, the green dials that they used to have. I don't know if you remember those uh, watches with, that would light up at night. And they were mm -hmm. Well, that was poison. Of the, so yeah. going back, so that's that's an example of where radiation can do a lot of harm. And, and, yeah. it, and, it makes it, and so they had to go there and clean it up. Oh, remember the old uh, the x-ray machine that you'd stick mm -hmm. your foot in so you could see how the, never mind, you're ra irradiating your foot. It's like, God, oh, uh, and then they had the radium water. Uh, right. Yeah. All that stuff. So, so yes. Uh, so that they had to go clean up. They mean in the U.S., uh, mm -hmm. the United States government had to go there and clean up what they created there. And uh, so since that time on, or even before that time, there, there's been all kinds of activity. Of course, if you read uh, 
so-called scientific explanation that science the scientists always want to explain things away but they can't they can't explain the soul away <laughs> or, or the spirit away so they don't these are I always tell people that when you talk about relativity it's a theory it says theory mm -hmm. it doesn't say the law it's still a theory all these years it's a theory so you can have theories about anything you can uh, say a theory uh, one theory is that there was a meteorite that crashed into that desert in uh, many, many, many years ago, and it's buried there, and that's what's causing all the interference. Mm -hmm. and, and also, it may be a, a, an area that attracts ETs, extraterrestrials, because it's, it's like a signal, it's a beacon, and they, so they land there, and that's where they see these ETs walking around, and people have experience seeing ghostly figures, if you want to go use that word, walking around and, and having encounters with people like that. That's, who knows? So again, theory, okay? Mm -hmm. Nobody said it was, it was, uh, and a lot of scientific knowledge that we have are still theories. Quantum mechanics is full theory. No one, no one has ever, ever seen an atom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have, they, they've experimented and felt effects of things, and those effects, they attribute to an atom. It doesn't really look like a little planet, okay, with, <laughs> with the, like the satellite. What uh, is that a coincidence or what? You know, you, you look at an atom and there's a little electrons revolving around it. And as a, it looks like uh, the planets. So that's that's a paradigm. That those are models made up by mm -hmm. human beings. They're theories. So even in science, there's a lot of doubt and skepticism. How things look like? How does an atom look like? Oh, there isn't a scientist out there that can explain how gravity works. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, exactly. They, they act like they do until you mm -hmm. ask, okay, explain this to us in plain English. And then they're like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? Scientists, uh, I, I'm, and I'm a science person. So so scientists sometimes remind me of sorcerers. You know how they go up there and they put, put, put a bunch of mathematical equations on a blackboard. No one could understand it, including myself when I took physics. I said, why? What's all this about? Why don't you just tell me the formula? Why you got to go through this entire blackboard of numbers? And you see this in sci-fi movies, but that's for real. <laughs> if, you take, mm -hmm. if you go to school, you have somebody, some scientist, and just to tell you one little thing, he goes there, and half of that stuff, a lot of it, people don't understand what it is. But yeah. they want you to use those equations. You know, I, I studied all the way to uh, differential calculus. It's a school for my degrees. <laughs> All that math, is, and that's all good. Math is all good because, uh, uh, you know, I'm an advocate of science education, math and science. But still, is, is there are theories and, and there are numbers. And numbers, it's like the writings on the wall. You have to interpret numbers. Hmm. Getting back to some of your poems, mm -hmm. you, wrote, you wrote a book called The Man with No Eyes. Uh, I think I know what it's about, but uh, could you... Clear up the, the darkness for me there. Yeah, the, the poem is uh, El, hombre, El, hombre, El Hombre Sin Ojos. It's a, it's a little prose poem. And uh, it, it's actually, to me, it's a sentimental piece, but for me, because I wrote it. Mm -hmm. And so let me let me look at it real quick. I have it, I have it uh, just so I can, um, if I say something, I want to mention that what, what it is. I have the same problem. People will ask me questions about some of the books I wrote, and I'll have to. Yeah. Uh, could you tell me what it is? I so, wrote. so say el hombre sin ojo, and and then I I purposely give you what that means right away. You know, so I say the man with without eyes sits on a tropical island, looking towards a lagoon. Pink and gray flamingos step in and out of the swallow, the shallow water, palm trees ride the wind but he's actually in a blue room facing a rocky river in hamilton ohio mm -hmm. now the to, to make a long story short so i was uh i had the opportunity to go and, and study or, or take classes or say, at AFIT. AFIT is the air force institute of technology which is in fairborn ohio so i I must have, i call that my second home because i went through this in 1981 into 1920 into 2021. I mean, I, I almost 30 years I've been going back and forth to, to Ohio, to Dayton, Ohio, to Fairborn, Ohio. So one time I was traveling through Ohio and I see this sign poetry reading. 
So I go in there, and it was in Hamilton, Ohio. It was in Hamilton, Ohio. Uh, the other, so that's part of it. I was in Hamilton, Ohio. The other part is that in Dayton, Ohio, they have like a river. It's like a river walk, and there's a community college there or a college called Sinclair College. College, and I used to like to go go there and walk, and look at that, at that, uh, at the river and enjoy myself there, and just by you know, joining the scenery and just uh, walking through the town of Dayton, Ohio. And so I started thinking about, I saw the YMCA and I said, I started thinking, I wonder, you know, if there's somebody there that, that is sitting in one of those small rooms and they can, and they could be blind. They don't have any, you know, sight, but they can hear the river. And from listening to a river, like when I lived in Far Rockaway, I lived in Far Rockaway Beach. I could go to the sea and imagine a lot of things. I can see, you know, I would look out and imagine islands and all that. So, the tropical island is is a way to talk about uh, maybe a tropical island like Puerto Rico. But this man still has a desire, mm -hmm. but he's actually not in Puerto Rico. It's a longing to be there. So he's blind to, to the actuality of, of, of a tropical island. And so he's actually sitting in Hamilton, Ohio. And I used Hamilton, Ohio because I wanted to pay tribute to my experience there in reading poetry, which was very positive at that center. You know, when I read my poems there, people really enjoy them and they, they you know, they welcome me in, in Hamilton, Ohio. So that is a backstory. It's not all in there, but that's what that poem's about. Well, how about the city of Aguadillo? Uh, yeah, yeah, the city of Aguadilla, my visit to Puerto Rico as an adult one, one time in my life, <laughs> believe it or not. I, I visited Puerto Rico only twice, one, one time when my grandmother died, and I was in the military, I was in the army, so I flew from West Germany, I, I flew from Germany to Puerto Rico, and from Puerto Rico back to Germany. <laughs> Think about that flight mm. uh, back, back in, the, in the 70s. Uh, that's uh, and then I only stayed there too because my grandmother had passed away. I only, and I only met her twice. So the uh, the Aguadilla when I went to Puerto Rico a couple of years ago, it's Aguadilla is where I was born. Mm -hmm. And so they have a plaza there, which is very similar to what you would see in New Mexico. Like if you go to New Mexico, there's a church there, and this is the plaza. And you see the, the, the church, and then. Uh, Puerto Rico is, is, is 35 miles by 100 miles. It, it's tiny. So anywhere you go, you're going to see the ocean. <laughs> so you can see the ocean. So when I was there, I saw this guy and walking around and he kept looking at license plates. I said, and he was a, an older guy and I described him, you know, mustache, white mustache, green eyes. And he spoke to me. I said, what are you doing? And, and it was early in the morning. He said, I'm looking at the license plates. And I said, I didn't understand. He said something. Uh, we were speaking in Spanish, and uh, you know my Spanish is pretty good, but I, I didn't quite understand. And I found that as a mystical experience or, or some kind of experience going on with this guy. Why is he going around, you know, checking out all the license plates? It, you know that in Puerto Rico, you're not going to have a, a license plate from California, <laughs> right? Because it's an island. You can't drive to Puerto Rico, okay? Let's face that. So I wrote this poem about him, and it, it came out of my imagination. Mm, awesome. uh, uh, and maybe I'll just read the landing of it so you can see where I go with this. And it's uh, interesting enough, it's right across from the, I didn't know this, that I put it right across the one that says El Hombre Sin Ojos. I, I, somehow my brain made that connection. So at the end I say uh, that he's looking at all the license plates on the Spanish plaza will add up to seven. Then a starship will descend in, onto the city and a beam from another star system will transform us into a higher human beings. So that came out of my imagination, you know, my sci-fi stuff, my supernatural stuff. Uh, I figured that he he was waiting for some sort of sign so all of them could, could you know, to line up. And and that's part of, uh, you know, that's part of numerolo numerology. Mm -hmm. The numbers are very important, uh, numbers that show up. And so maybe uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a uh, uh, an imaginative what they call imaginative rendering or story that I uh, I made up from it, from my encounter with him. Well, I was kind of just a little concerned that maybe there's a guy in Puerto Rico that has such abilities. Mm -hmm. 
Well, he could. I don't know. <laughs> I only met him once. There's a lot of things all over the world, you know. But who knows? Uh, so that I, so some. Of, that's what I'm saying. See, what I'm trying to do is uh, I'm trying to break boundaries and borders in terms of literature. Most of the time, people say poetry. They start thinking about love. They start thinking mm -hmm. about death. They start thinking about politics. And there's a lot of politics now in poetry. Oh. I won't go into it. And so I said, I want to move away from that. You know, the you have a magazine like Analog. I don't know if you can see it, the magazine Analog. It, Analog is a sci-fi magazine. They publish poetry in here. A lot of people don't know that. You know, they think, oh, I'm not going to read that. It's all about sci-fi. Sci it says science fiction and facts. Analog mm -hmm. magazine. You can get this up anywhere. So I'm trying to move, you know, get people to enjoy poetry, but based on sci-fi, supernatural events, put it in that language. And that's that poem that I read, The, the Man from Aguadilla and the, El Hombre Sin Ojo, those are, they border on what I call sci-fi supernatural poetry that, that mm -hmm. deals with those subjects and uses those writing techniques of using your imagination. A big word for that that people use now is called speculative fiction. That's the that's the new word that you hear when they say speculative free fiction. They're speaking about sci-fi, horror, uh, fantasy, and that now in a lot of writing, it's crossbreeding. Mm. It's hybrid. Everything is mixed up. Like that was about a man that I saw, and then he went to a sort of like a an imaginative world that that it has to do with your imagination. So, th and so that's what I'm trying to accomplish now with my, and that's accomplishing my book that I push, I'm pushing that envelope, like they say, out of this arena of always about emotion, about the death of somebody, a death of a loved one, or falling in love, happiness, you know, theology, all, all those subjects that you always hear about that are almost like stereotypes and cliches about poetry and rhyme, everything has to rhyme. And, yeah. And it sounds, you know, it sounds uh, how it, it just sounds odd to the to our modern ear to hear something rhyming. Yeah. Oh, so well, yes. I, I've mentioned this a few times. I'm not into poetry. It's just uh, my thing. But I did read your book and I was entertained by it and I enjoyed most of you know like even though I didn't understand some of what was going on, mm -hmm. it was still a, a good read. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, thank you. And you know that's that's what I, uh, I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get. I'm, I want to. I want. I hate to use this word. I'm sort of like an evangelist, <laughs> trying to evangelize the those people that may steer away from poetry. Now, mm. I'm going to have to say that book is rare because most of the poems that the books that you find at Barnes and Noble and on the web are those the ones that are described about death, love, hate, or or whatever, injustice, what they call social injustice, yeah. uh, justice, whatever you want. And, and you know, that, that gets old after a while. <laughs> it really does. So I, I want to move. I want to move to to attract people that, that like other things besides, you know, this pain and suffering that we talk about and, and this bad news stuff. And it's for entertainment. You can, you can entertain yourself. The poem called The Lieutenant. Was his name William by chance? Uh, I don't know because I didn't know his na his first name. Oh. I know I know his last name. I can tell you. I want to keep his. I don't yeah. really. I can tell you. I'm just gonna say that his last name started with a C. Yep. Yep. Yeah, he went to uh, basic training at Fort Bliss. Oh wow! Here, here in that. Texas. Uh, that was a pretty nasty situation. Uh, yes, no yes. excuse for it, but uh, I wasn't there, yeah. so I can't really lay too much of a judgment on the situation, but it gave the military a black eye and a half. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I felt it too. I, I felt that just like you did, and uh, I didn't. I purposely did not give any details. I just gave a, a generic situation, and I'm really, I'm going to say surprised and happy that, that you were able to to know, because there's a lot of people, young people, they, they don't even know what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. So if you get too specific, mm -hmm. then you get 
you get into this emotional argument, you know, and so I didn't want, I don't want, I didn't want to go there. So mm -hmm. I just made it very, very uh, generic about how sometimes we do stuff, including myself and uh, the uh, Anola Gay, as you know, the, the bombs that were dropped in Japan, all that stuff. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a pacifist per se, but there has to be some reason behind going to war or doing stuff. I, I don't want to, and again, like you said, we don't want to go into that kind of politics. There's a lot of uh, ideas circling around. But yes, that, that is a poem about that individual. Sometimes going to war with somebody and destroying their populace is, I hate to say this, it's necessary. It was the only way that Adolf Hitler was going to be stopped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then we've got a lot of situations where it's more economics than uh, tyranny. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, yeah, it's it's such a it devastates a lot of uh, a lot of people and mm -hmm. not much good that comes from it mm -hmm. most of the time. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you uh, with that. And I, and what it does is, like as you said. Uh, uh, it, it puts the uh, DOD uh, and our uh, military in a bad spotlight mm. with, with shitting because mm -hmm. I think it's essential. I really do. I know I'm great. Sounds crazy. We, we need to have defenders yes. of our land, no matter what. So, uh, but when we do dumb things like, like, then that hurts us. It hurts us. You're, are you currently working on your next book or are you collecting ideas? I uh, I actually uh, wrote my second book already, wow. and and I sent it out. Of course, the good news is it got rejected. <laughs> I, I really, it always gets rejected. If you send out books, they get rejected uh, over and over again. I, I sent that book out, the one that Son of Silence, I got rejected multiple times. Hmm. Yeah, it, it doesn't. Yeah, but each rejection that I get, I learn something, and I ask myself, why was it rejected? And you know what? Here's the bad part. They don't tell you. Hmm. But I said there must be something in it. Was it the politics? Did I have any politics in it? Was it the writing? What was it? They don't tell you what the rejection is. But yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, the one I, I wrote about, the, my la latest book is called Lucky City. Lucky City. And uh, it's, it's a totally different book. It's, it's, uh, and I'm ch already changing the title. I was talking to my nephew. I'm going to title it Rockaway. Rockaway. Because Rockaway is, uh, it's my, it's, I consider that my place of origin. Mm. You know, when I, I went to uh, elementary school in a uh, part of Manhattan, but then in, in the third grade was when I moved to Rockaway, Far Rockaway. So my experiences there were, were shaped uh, based on this peninsula. And I love living in Far Rockaway because it was a peninsula. And by the way, Far Rockaway was the one that got hit by the storm Sandy really bad. Mm. And it was all over the news. That's the place where I'm from where I grew up and was raised. And there I went to Far Rockaway High School. <laughs> you know, so so my book deals with that, but it deals with other subjects, uh, a lot of different subjects. Uh, you know, because I, I thread, what I try to do is thread different themes through the different books. Like this book here, Son of Sinus, talked about the military. It talked about uh, uh, space creatures. <laughs> You know, it went, so there's a couple of threats. There's also some personal things in the military. Like there's a poem about my brother, who was in the army too, passed away, and uh, it's a poem uh, that touches a little bit about my daughter. So it gets personal, but I don't want it to be autobiographical, so people get stuck on that. So it, it hits a lot of spectrums. It's about the zone de silence. It's, it's la zona de silencio. It's about what we would do if we if we encounter aliens or ETs, what they call them, are we going to, you know, do the DOD thing that they, the stereotype movie thing where now we pull out the tanks and blow everybody away? Oh. <laughs> it's a stereotype, it's a cliche. Every alien that, seems like every alien that comes down, and I, I read somewhere that there's two belief systems. One is that they're here to harm us. The other one is they're here to help us. But the school that's winning out, they're here to harm us. So all the aliens are here to do something bad to us, and there are very few come out come here to help us. Mm. So you have to balance those two extremes uh, in the writing. And I think I, I did that in my writing, 
uh, and uh, if you follow it, you know, because by zone of silence, a little narrative or microfiction, it's when they come to help us, <laughs> we blow them away. With, with it. And, and that's, and then at the end, the very last poem is they come to, instead of they're coming to help us or, or, or even they come to ask us for help, mm -hmm. but we don't, we don't destroy them. We, we say, we don't have any answers. Sorry. We, we don't have any answers for you. And so the last, one of the next to last poem is what happens there. So this, 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 these, this book is like a little, the stories, you know, narratives that you have to follow. There's several narratives in here. It it's, uh, makes it a little complicated. So at the end of this poem that I titled Arrival, I say, and as easy as twilight arrived, their starship disappeared. Homeless, they left without their wish, their dreams ahead. See, they were dreaming that that we would give them some kind of answer about uh, and at the end, and the question that they ask is, "Where's heaven?" And you can take that metaphorically when they say, "Where's heaven?" Right? Is it a physical heaven, or is it where's peace? Where can we find peace? Where we, where can we find love? Where we can find friendship? And they came to us, and we we just didn't know. We said we don't know, so they left. It's not like somebody knocking on your door, and and you want <laughs> they looking for help. Is they go away? <laughs> we don't. We can't help you. Because we can't help ourselves. That that's the difference. We can't help ourselves. So how can we help you? If they're looking for peace, it ain't going to be found here. <laughs> yeah. That's why they left. <laughs> well, before I let you go, uh, okay. anything sure. you'd like to pass on to somebody who's thinking mm -hmm. they want to write a poem, but they just don't do it. Well, I I think that a lot of people. Uh, believe that to write poetry it's some kind of supernatural thing that there's some voice or a guardian angel or something alien or something comes to you from the outside and you're going to play go inside you because the word inspiration means to breathe in but that's not true if you want to write a poem just sit down on a piece of paper get a piece of paper and write now what you write may not be you know, the perfect poem. As you know, you have to revise it, but write it. Write it. You don't have to take any kind of special training or class, but if you really get serious, then you might want to join a group. And I'm sure that in Laredo and other places, they have groups that, that like to write poetry, like to write fiction and what have you, and go there. And that's how you develop your skills. So I would say, do it. Forget about this idea that some sort of, talent or supernatural or you're born with a gift no everybody has a gift everybody uh, can do it there's no secret to it get a piece of paper write it and then share it with someone share it with a group and that's how you develop poems and then you'll get published eventually so that's that's my advice to any writer out there and also think about your subject and you know sci-fi and fantasy is still good <laughs> still good subjects mm -hmm. we need more people to go in that direction and, and read poetry. Also, obviously, as we said before, read, read, read stuff, uh, contemporary stuff. And read, uh, the, the, uh, I was gonna say, just don't read poetry books, read other kind of books. Read fiction, read short stories. You know, read the paper, uh, I was gonna say read the newspaper, but <laughs> there's no newspaper. <laughs> there's no <laughs> newspaper to read, except online, right? Yes. Yeah, so that's what I would say. That's what I would say. Well, fantastic. This has been an interesting hour and a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you being on with me. Uh, this has been Strange Things with Chris James interviewing Dario Beniquez from San Antonio and other parts of the world. And until next Saturday, hope you all enjoyed the show. Thank you. Got the wrong mouse. Are you? Are you? Coming to the tree With a strong upper man The same murder three Strange things that I've been hearing How stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree